After playing around a bit with Houdini 19, Karma, and some of the more low-level nodes in SOPS, and being triggered by a question in the comments, I decided today we'd build this. This weird flesh plasticky looking thing. And what I want to point out is that crumply bit down here, those wrinkles. The technique here is anything but new and it's called a stretch, stress or distortion map, which in turn is driving a rather simple and honestly amateurish shader built in Material X. So let's get started. As my main geo, as you might have figured out by now, I'm going to use a tube, which I'll just drop down here and dive in there. In here I want to set up my tube so that it's a bit more subdivided, a bit longer. I'll do that by scaling down the radius to 0 0.2 and setting the rows to 120 and the columns to 80. So we get something that has roughly square patches. If you want to use textures, texture maps, it's always handy to have a UV texture on here, which I'll set up to be cylindrical along the Y axis. And next, before I'm going to deform this tube here, I'll start by creating an attribute using an attribute create. And the attribute I'm going to create is called distortion. It'll be a float attribute stored on the points and by default, it's set to zero. So everything at default here. Next, I want to measure this geometry's patches initial area by using a measure node set to work on the points. Yes, I want to measure the area. Area. Let's just check the tool handle here. We can see that this area is uniform across all patches. Then let's deform this here by using a bend node in our case. You could use any node that you want. And let's set the capture origin of this thing by scrolling down here to be all zeros and the capture direction to be along the Y axis with a capture length of quarter of a unit, 0 0.25 like this. And then we can bend this here. When we move up here, we can see the bend angle here, so we can animate just this. And I'm going to animate this between zero, so not bent at all, at our first frame by alt clicking in here and then going to frame maybe 96 and setting that bend angle to I don't know, maybe minus 110 or maybe even further minus 120, alt click in here again, to keyframe this. And then if I shift click in here to bring up the curve editor, I just want to highlight this curve here and switch its interpolation to linear. So now when I hit play and before I do that toggle real time, I can see that my tube is now slowly bending towards that side like this. Let's go to, I don't know, frame 72 here. And what I want to do now is after I transform this geometry, after I bent it, I want to remeasure its area here. So what I can do is just copy and paste this measure node down here and highlight it. And you you can see now we are seeing some areas that have been stretched and we should in theory be seeing areas that have been squished down here. Let's call the attribute into which we're writing the measured area, not area, but area two. So the second area after we deformed our geometry and to get the amount of deformation that every part of this geometry has, what I want to do is I want to take the original area of the undeformed geometry and from it subtract the deformed area. And that difference should give me a rough indication of where deformation like squishing or stretching has happened. Traditionally, I would drop down a line of vex or use vops to do that. However, in Houdini 19, we can use the attrib combine, which I'll wire in after the second measure down here, highlight it. And in its properties here, I want to set the destination to be the area. And from this, I want to subtract the area two. just drag this down to control. But yeah, that's all I can do in here and all I want to do. So to visualize this, I've been made aware that I misused or abused the visualize node in my previous Houdini 19 tutorial. So here's a way easier method to visualize attributes. Just hover over the node, go to the info box here. And in here, I just want to scroll down to my attribute. We had layout here due to my resolution. So let's drag this out. And I want to visualize the area attribute. So I'm just going to click on it. And now I can see getting this indication here in blue, gray and red. And I right click on my visualizers here and modify the area visualizer. Let's just get rid of that white in here and exchange it by maybe green. So I can see the rough values of my attribute here. Again, let's highlight the attribute combine here and go to the geometry spreadsheet. And let's have a look at the area which now stores my distortion here. I can see this distortion parameter that's now stored in this area here goes from a rather small positive to a rather small negative value. So now instead of leaving this attribute named area, let's call it distortion instead. And now I realize I shouldn't have dropped down and wouldn't have needed this attrib create up here. So let's just bypass it and delete it. And down here, let's use an attrib rename to rename our attribute called area to distortion. Now you can see our visualizer is gone because we don't have any attribute named area anymore. So in our visualizers here, let's right click on the area visualizer and edit this and instead just delete the area and visualize the distortion like this and close it. Now in order to be able to properly build that wrinkle shader later, I want my distortion attribute to be in the zero to one range. And to bring it to that range, I'm going to use the attrib remap node, 
and go to the frame where I have the most prominent distortion that's at the end of my animation here, frame 96. And now in the attribute remap, I'm gonna specify the attribute that I wanna remap, in our case, the distortion, and hit compute range. So now that'll automatically look up the smallest and largest value that we have. And I wanna do this on the last frame of my animation here because here we will have the largest amount of distortion. Again, ranging from a negative small value to a positive small value, and I want those values to be in the zero to one range. Also, I wanna use the ramp and make sure that we don't have negative values in here by just moving the low point here to the 0.5 position. And also let's drag down this ramp here. Let's give this a bit more of an organic interpolation so it doesn't linearly rise from these edges, which makes my shader in the end a bit more unnatural, unrealistic. So instead let's set the spline points to be all B spline here for the first and the second point as well. And add two more points, one at the end, which I'll drag up to full one and one down here, maybe a 0.75, which I'll drag down to be zero. And let's just correct that to 0.75 and this one to 0.9, like so. Okay, this gives me one component of the shader I wanna build, the amount of distortion. However, I also would like to have a direction into which the main direction of the wrinkles should go. And for that, and to blur this together with the values in the area that are not wrinkled, so not distorted, I'm gonna create a few things. First, I'll create a boundary group, which I'll later use to smooth out a few attributes. I'm gonna use a group expression for that. And in here, I wanna specify a point group, which I'll call boundary. And I want to have everything in here where the distortion is bigger than zero. So basically now I selected all those points in which my distortion and my wrinkles will happen. Next, to get the main direction of those wrinkles, let's again use a measure sop, which will set to work on points. And we want to measure the gradient of an attribute and our attribute that we want to measure the gradient of is called distortion. Again, let's visualize this. We can see a few small blue arrows here, but again, let's go to the information symbol here and click on distortion. And in the visualizers, right click here. To visualize it again, let's go to the information tab here and let's uncheck distortion and instead click the gradient here. And we can't see much yet. So let's right click in here and adjust our gradient visualizer by setting its type to be a marker and then a vector. And now we can see that we are getting, when we dial the length scale a bit smaller in here, we are getting those yellow arrows indicating the gradient of that distortion. And that looks like a nice vector for the main direction of our wrinkles. However, as you have seen, these vectors are not unit length. So they have some length depending on the amount of distortion we have. However, as they should only indicate the direction of my wrinkles and not the strength of them, I'll have a distortion attribute to do that. I want to make sure that they have always the length of one. So I want to normalize them. Usually again, a job for bobs or vex, but in Houdini 19, I can use the adjust vector so I'll drop that down and i'll uncheck adjust value just scroll down here and check enable post process and then make vectors unit length and also let's scroll up here make sure that i have the gradient selected like so and now they should have a length of one okay back in our visualizers here let's enable the area and disable the gradient visualizer and as you can see the difference in this distortion here at these edges is quite strong. And what I would like for a bit more organic shading is those values to fade out a bit. So I wanna blur them. In this case, using an attribute blur, set to blur my distortion. Let's uncheck pin border points and let's increase our blurring iterations. Let's also make sure we select the boundary group and I just noticed that I named this wrongly. So let's go back to the group expressions here and I wanna just name this boundary like so. And then again, go back to the attribute blur. Let's call this one boundary. And now you can see I can dial in my blurring here with 16 iterations being what I want for now smoothing out this transition here quite a bit. However, I also would like to smooth out my gradient. So let's uncheck that and check the gradient visualizer here and maybe in the visualizer editor, let's scale back the vector length here just for the visualization. So I wanna smooth those out a bit. In this case, using the attrib fill, working pretty similar sometimes like the blur, setting its mode to blur, the fusion, again, makes it very similar to the attrib blur. And I wanna blur out the gradient here and work on everything but the boundary group. So select the boundary and put an exclamation mark in front of it and leave everything else as is. However, please select my gradient here. And now you can see we just smoothed out the gradient a good bit in these edge areas here. Okay, finally, let's add a normals to this using a normal node set to work on the vertices with a cusp angle of 22. And then finally, let's add a null and call this one out. And so far we are finished in SOPs. So again, what did we do? We built a tube here, then added UVs to it, measured its individual polygons area, then deformed it, measured the area of each polygon again, then using the attrib combine, subtracted it from the original area to get the distortion, which we then renamed from area to distortion. So it actually has a self-explanatory attribute name and then remapped it to be between the zero and one range and also making sure it fades out smoothly on these edges. Then we selected all the points 
that have been heavily deformed or have been deformed at all and use the measure again to get the direction of our wrinkles by just measuring the deformations gradient that means the deformations main direction of change and then normalized this gradient so to make sure that the vectors here that every single one of those vectors has a length of one and then we blurred out the distortion to cover up a bit of the transition from the undeformed to the deformed parts did the same thing for the gradient here using the new attribute fill and then created normals on our mesh and finally had a null as an output here and you can see this all still animates so maybe at this frame let's head over to solaris switching my desktop to the solaris desktop and in here the very first thing i'm going to do is use the sub import and i want to point this to the out null we just created bringing in this tube here and i'm seeing that maybe i could have added some caps but that's for later maybe next let's create and add a few materials to this one so I'm going to use a material library, which I'll wire in after the sub import and dive in there. And in here, I'm going to build a short node chain, a short material using Material X, commas and comma XP as new material system. I'm going to use Material X because it's the best supported material in comma XPU. And also, as from my understanding, it'll be the material system and material standard that Houdini will go for for the future. And also in future versions of Unreal Engines, it appears to be supported. And in this case, I want to build a material that does some distortion here in those areas where we bent our geometry. And I want to use this placement for that. For that to work, the first thing I need to do is drop a collect node, which is going to collect all of our shaders. And then we can apply this as our material onto our geometry here. And the shaders I want to put in there are the Material X standard surface. So that goes into the shader one slot. And let's zoom out a bit. The Material X displacement. So that goes into the second shader slot like so. Let's drag this down below the standard material and just drag this collect slot onto the geometry here and select set as material on sub import one component. So now if I dial in color here under the Material X standard surface, the base color, maybe let's get something flesh colored like maybe this. That should also be visible in the viewport. So far so good. Back to our stage level. In here I want to control click on the camera icon up here and the environment light creating a camera and an environment light. And some of you asked me how you'd get rid of this light visualizer here in the viewport. That is by clicking here on that icon. I want to make sure the camera is locked to the viewport. And as for my environment for my dome light, I want to select a texture, in this case an HDRI, which I downloaded from HDRI Haven or Polyhaven as they're called nowadays, I think. I'm going to increase its intensity a tiny bit to two. And then I'll add a Karma node, setting up Karma XPU, increasing the pixel samples quite drastically and scrolling down here, going to the limits, maybe also adding a bit more diffuse bounces like this. Okay, let's save this and switch our perspective viewport to Karma to get that real-time rendering going. And after a short moment, I'm greeted with this here. So let's frame this, I don't know, something like this and uncheck the camera lock to viewport. And then let's go back into our material library. And in here, the first thing under the material standard surface is I want to dial back my specular. On the one hand, it's strength. On the other hand, I want to increase its roughness, maybe like so, something like this. And then let's build this displacement shape for this area where the distortion is. So clearly I want to bring in those attributes that I created to drive them, namely the gradient and the distortion. I can do that by employing a Material X prim var reader. So that's Material X's bind or bind import if you want so. And we're going to copy and paste this. So we'll have two versions of this. The first one I'm going to set to work on a float. And when I go over here to the SOP import and to the mesh, I can see the prim bars that we imported here by their name. And I'm interested on the distortion here and the gradient. So as a float here on the first reader, I'll read in the distortion. And down here in the second reader, I'll set this to be a vector three and read in the gradient like this. The easiest thing I could do is now when I right click and under the material X group, go to procedural 3D, I'm just going to take a fractal 3D noise and wire that in our displacement here. And you can see that's a bit coarse. So I'll dial up its lacunarity. Let's set it to seven and maybe also increase its octaves to say six. So really strong displacement here. Too strong, I'd argue. And also its displacement over the whole tube and not only in those distorted areas here. So the first thing I could try is wire in this prim bar here that stores the or reads the distortion from our mesh and wire that into our displacement scale here. And now you can see we have very drastic but limited distortion only to this area here that we selected in our SOPs. Still a bit too strong, so I could use a Material X multiply. And this is what threw me off when I first tried this out. With Material X, you have your separate math nodes. So don't try using Houdini's old VOPS math nodes. Just stick to those within the Material X group. The other ones won't work or won't work reliably. So again, let's use a multiply here and wire that in between our prim bar reader and the material displacement. And then let's just dial back this multiplier here, maybe to something really small like this. And now you can see we have only this slight distortion happening here in this area, which we selected. However, we are not 
using the gradient, so the main direction in which our wrinkles should fall. And also I found it a bit weird to directly wire in the strength here in the scale factor on the material X displacement. I think that should be left for manual tweaks. So let's cut this and rebuild this whole thing. So I'll stick with my material fractal here and with my primbar readers that read in distortion and gradient. However, I'm gonna get rid of the multiply for now. What I wanna do is take my mesh position here and add to it the gradient here that we read in and then feed this in as a position in our fractal noise here. And this will give me that distortion along the wrinkle direction. I'm gonna do this by first reading in my global position using the material X position here and then using an add node again using the material X math to add together the position and the gradient here. And to be able to dial in the strength of that effect also after I've read in the gradient, I wanna again use a multiply set to work on a vector, it goes in here in between. And when preparing that setup, a value of all twos resulted in some nice shading. Again, this can be used to dial in the scale of this gradient here. And after I've added the gradient onto our global position in here, I wanna feed that into my position on which I would sample this fractal noise here. When preparing that setup, a value of of three for the octaves and six for lacunarity with a diminished value of 0 0.25 seemed to result in some nice shading. However, the output of that fractal here currently is zero centered. That means depending how side effects decided to implement this noise in here, the values coming out here range between minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5 or minus one to plus one. And I only want them to be in a very small range, say zero to 0 0.1. To put them into that range, I'm gonna use the range node that Material X brings with it, which takes our fractals output as its input here. And in here, I was able to achieve a really nice shading by setting the input lowest value to minus one and the highest value to one. So assuming that the output of this fractal node is in the range of minus one to one and then setting its maximum output value to 0 0.1 and also setting it to do clamping if we have values above that, which we should not. Finally, let's wire this into our displacement here. And we will see that yes, we see the effect of that gradient here, but we have displacement over the whole tube here. That is because we didn't bring in our distortion attribute here. So let's do that by moving this whole node chain to the left a bit to leave us a bit room to add another material X multiply, which goes in here, taking in the output of our range node and the prim bar that is called distortion that we read in here. So now we only have distortion in this area here. And now I wanna use the scale on the displacement here as an overall scaling factor to adjust that effect. And when setting this up, I think I decided on to a value of 0 0.2. So we end up with something like this. So quite an elaborate shader. And then again, also rather simple when you think about it or when you're used to working with nodes, maybe you have some experience in Redshift, Octane, Mantra, or maybe even Karma from previous versions. And now if I skip through the timeline, I see that as my distortion increases, so does the display placement in the distorted areas. One issue that remains when you have rather strong animation going on here, it could be a problem that we're using the global position here as an input for our fractal noise, but you could also use this tubes or your geometries, UV coordinates. The only thing you'd have to keep in mind when doing so is in the prim bar reader, setting it to a vector two or a vector three, in this case, maybe a vector three, although UVs only are two dimensional vector that would still work. The thing that you have to keep in mind is that in USD, the UV coordinates are translated into what USD called ST instead of UV. So instead of importing UV as you'd be used to, you would instead import the ST coordinates and use those as the position input to your shader, resulting in something similar, but maybe with a bit less distortion than using your global position. In this case, however, I'm gonna go with the global position. I'm gonna delete that ST node here, save this and call this a day for now. Admittedly, this shader needs a bit of tweaking. It looks a bit creepy at best, but I think it demonstrates a few principles. On the one hand, let me just bring up the OBJ level here. So in our tube here, on the one hand, we learned how we mask and procedurally select those areas that are distorted and also generate vectors out of those areas that give us a general direction of where those wrinkles should point to. And then here in our stage context in Solaris, we learned how to set up a material X shader that allows displacement and procedural displacement along this wrinkle direction where geometry is highly distorted. So if you take that principle and build it into something creepy, beautiful, Halloweenish, I don't know, don't be shy sharing. We always enjoy seeing your artwork. And if you enjoyed this tutorial and maybe want to support us or learn more about Houdini using in-depth courses, you might want to consider becoming a patron of ours. And for everyone already supporting us on Patreon, thanks so much, folks. Without your help in Tagma in this form, just plainly wouldn't be possible. And a very special thank you goes out to Rodeo FX, Important Looking Pirates, Sean Edwards, Chris Hebert, and Rafe Canadol. Thanks so much, folks. Well, with that, as always, it's time to say goodbye. So it's cheers and until next time.